what's up you guys we are back with behind the bikini episode number 25 make sure you like comment subscribe all the fun things and hit the bells below all of those all of those things below <laughs> we got check out the description box below we got all of our stuff in there um so you can follow us and work with us and all the, the all the fun things um today we're going to talk about that work. We're going to talk about the fact that most people underestimate what it takes to actually compete. So that is going to be our, our subject, our title for today. Um, kind of go through what to expect. Um, expect the unexpected, basically. Uh, but before we get into all that, happy Valentine's Day. Happy <laughs> I'm Valentine's my, I'm Day. I'm wearing my red, my, my, Olymp my Olympia red, my Olympia red. <laughs> I'm wearing candy hearts. What does it say? I can't, it's, it's upside down. I can't see what it says. It says like his babe kiss me till death i'm yours i've got my i got my coffee mug with a heart on it that's Valentine's oh Day. of course you have purpose. a of course you have a coffee mug with a heart on it of, of course, course you uh, this is not the only one that i have i have several <laughs> <laughs> like i've got one for every holiday are you kidding yes absolutely have you to. have one for every holiday for every hour of the holiday <laughs> yes right i'll switch one out for my afternoon coffee and then one exactly. for my tea at night you know you know work exactly. school um, super festive <laughs> yep, I got it. Got to do it. Well, I mean, I've got my my Valentine's tree up. So we, I think we talked about that here on this podcast. But I've got the, I've kept the Christmas tree up and decorated it for Valentine's Day. Um, Dan got me a bunch of stuff. I don't know what it is yet. I haven't opened it yet. But there's actual presents under the tree for the Valentine's tree. <laughs> That's sweet. Has your has your clean lady made any comments yet? <laughs> Uh, not that we've overheard. Not that we've overheard, but they probably have. They probably have. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> the funny part about them is like they're 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 Hispanic, right? So and my husband is Spanish. So a lot of times we'll be talking and think that he can't hear them. Understand. But yeah, he, he, he understands can. every word. <laughs> so, you know, it is what it is. We kinda know what's going on. Um, yes. yeah. sometimes you hear things you want and sometimes you don't. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, yep. the funny thing that the thing that makes me laugh about this stuff all the time is, you know, we have a security system in our house. We have video cameras everywhere, so we can see when people do stuff, even when we're not home. So it's just like there's just certain things I'm like, um, we need to we need to send this to their boss, kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been, been fun times. Sometimes I remember <laughs> when Drew's mom told me that she walked in one time on their cleaning lady taking a nap on their couch. <laughs> I was like, damn. <laughs> That's well, it's not been that bad. We haven't, we have definitely haven't caught them taking naps. That's for sure. But you know, we've seen yeah. some things, some things, lots of, lots of little stories and stuff like that. I mean, it is what it is, you know, you're letting people into your home. They're never going to treat it the way you would treat it. All of those kinds of things, you know, so you gotta just kind of protect yourself. Yep. Gotta protect yourself. That's it. That's yep. it. So, uh, well, this weekend we had the coaches weekend. Um, have you recovered from that? No. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it was a long I'm, weekend. It was, but it was so good. It was such a great yeah. weekend. And I mean, Saturday was a really long day. We, I mean, we were in classroom, what, from 8.30 till 6? Six? Six. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, with yeah. like 10 minute bathroom breaks every couple hours. So yeah. it, was, it was a long Saturday, but so good. So much good information. I learned a ton. Yeah. How about same. you? Same. Yeah, yeah. it was, um, it was, <laughs> so I might as well start off with my stressful situation getting there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, just, just going from, from the East coast to the, basically the West coast is a long travel day anyway, whatever you, however you slice it. Um, but it shouldn't have been as long as it was for me. Uh, we were, so I had a connecting flight in Chicago from here in DC. All of that went fine. No problem whatsoever. In the air from Chicago to Phoenix, um, I'm just watching videos on my phone and stuff like that. And all of a sudden the Wi-Fi goes out and that's interesting. I thought, because I just plugged my phone in. I thought maybe because I plugged my phone in, it turned the Wi-Fi off or something. So I was plugging in to charge it. No. So then like a couple of seconds later, there's an announcement over the, over the loudspeaker. Like, we are diverting to Tulsa. And we're like, Tulsa? That's not Phoenix. <laughs> I'm like, where? What's going on? And then they didn't tell us, tell, tell us anything. And the Wi-Fi is cut off. They didn't tell us why we're diverting. We didn't tell us nothing. That was it. They were like, we're diverting to Tulsa. And then went ghost. Like, bye. And we're all just sitting there like... Why? <laughs> so, you know, we have a group mess text message and uh, WhatsApp. So I was getting little bits of like the 5G coming through. So I'm trying to get messages to send. So as I'm sitting there, I'm like, is something going on in Phoenix? I'm like, because we're not able to land in Phoenix for whatever reason. And so then everybody starts freaking out. No, I don't think anything's like, because a lot of people are traveling and stuff. So we get, but the thing that, that freaked us out more than anything else, like I said, like they, they just told us we were diverting to Tulsa and didn't tell us why. So we're like, 
like, is there something, I, my thought process was I thought there was something going on at the Phoenix airport, you know, like a, a terrorist threat or something like that. And that we couldn't, we couldn't land there, you know? So, um, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes later, they finally came back on the loudspeaker on the, on the flight and told us that it was because the fuel engines on the left-hand side weren't working. <laughs> we were like, oh, awesome. Fantastic. And you're, and you're messaging all of us at this time. And we're I like, know. What the fuck is going on? I know. Yeah. I was like, um, this plane is going to blow up in midair. Like I've never experienced anything like this before in my life. Um, so we made the emergency emergency landing and like when we landed there were um like emergency vehicles like surrounding the plane we couldn't even go up to the airport because they had to check like the brake temperature and the temperature of the engine and stuff to make sure that we weren't overheating so that we didn't like blow up the airport like we're getting too close so yeah it was it was just fun times so then you know we're in the middle of oklahoma tulsa there's nothing there i mean the one one guy walked around the whole airport once we were deported and he walked, walked around the airport. He's like, there's like, it's like, there's like three planes at this whole airport. <laughs> He's like, we're not getting out of here. Like everybody's freaking out. There was a big golf tournament in Phoenix this weekend. So most of the people that were on my flight were going to that golf tournament. So they oh, were all yeah. freaking out. They mm -hmm. were all freaking out because they were like, we got to be there for, like they spent thousands of dollars on the tickets and all this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And, um. So they're all like trying to rebook flights. Like the one, like one guy booked, rebooked a flight for like twelve hundred dollars on a different airline, so that he could make sure he could get there and everything like that. I'm sitting there. I'm like, I went to talk to one of the guys at the at the airport. I said, um, so what, I'm like, do you have any idea what's going on? He's like, they're gonna try to fix the plane. He's like, your best bet. He's like, honestly, is just to be patient. He's like, if they can fix the plane, you guys will get reboarded and you'll go to you'll go to Phoenix. He's like, because otherwise you're gonna have to get a new flight and you're not getting out today. <laughs> I was like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Cool story. So then we started getting these uh, messages on the update or uh, texts on the, the app, the update, um, saying that we're gonna we're gonna reboard. So he's like the the guy, the same guy. He was like, yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna reboard at that time, but what that is telling you is that they're fixing the plane. And I was like, cool. I'm like, I can handle that. So you know, I got to Phoenix what like five hours after I was supposed to, but at least I got there. But it was just a long day. You know, I left DC at like. I left my house. I left my house at six thirty in the morning, and then I didn't get to to Phoenix until what was it like eight thirty that night or eight o'clock or something? Yeah, um, because you came in right where you, when we were ending the cocktail hour. Yeah, yeah. so about eight thirty. I got there with ten minutes to spare because he gave me a glass of wine. He just filled it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, thanks. I need that. <laughs> yeah. So that was a very long day. Um, I passed out hard when I got to the room. It was just like I was done. And so then, yeah, and then we had the whole long day of, of Saturday, um, which again, was a lot of information. It was very good. I still have to go through and like review all the notes and stuff that I took and all of that too. So I really appreciate that kind of thing as far as like the continued education, um, a, because things are always changing. Like that's the biggest thing. And like, as we, as we learn more about the human body and about how it functions and all that kind of stuff, we can apply that and use it um to benefit ourselves and our clients all that kind of stuff too so you know that was pretty cool and then um like going through the blood work panels and stuff and learning about those kinds of things that was my favorite part of it because you, a lot of times for those people that have done blood work before like they're just a bunch of numbers a bunch of gobbledygook you don't really know what you're looking at so it was kind of cool to get a better understanding of what that meant and what that was like oh well, that makes sense Oh, like I was having a lot of like eureka moments sitting there like, oh, okay, I get it now. That I understand that now, you know, so, um, so that was really cool. Um, and then just having the, you know, the, the, the bonding experience and stuff with everybody there too, because, you know, most of the time, you know, we've talked about this before, we, we see each other when we're at shows and it's like, you're so busy either tending to yourself or to your clients that you don't get a chance to actually like converse with people. Spend you know time, what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like you don't get that kind of, that kind of time. And I felt like that was the, mainly on Sunday was when we got a chance to do that kind of thing. So that was fun. I enjoyed hanging out with you guys for Super Bowl. I was like, that worked out That worked out perfect. I didn't plan it like that with my flight and stuff like that, but I got to hang out and watch the whole game and all that kind of stuff and do my training, do training with Drew and all of that too, which that was fun implementing that yesterday. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh my God. There was like, and again, going back to just having Eureka moments and stuff, um, just certain things like, um, him helping me figure out where I need to stop my range of motion and, and stuff like that was really big. And like knowing how to, you know, how to keep my, my spine, sp spine straight and scoop and all that kind of stuff. And then also like I've mentioned, I always have a hard time with activating my right glute. 
Um, and it's because my adductors are so tight. I didn't, I knew my hamstrings were tight. I didn't know specifically. So he was able to tell me kind of where to pinpoint stuff. And like when we were doing the foam rolling and, and everything, I felt it actually hit and then the referred pain go right into my right glute where I can't activate and where it's tight and I can't get it to loosen up. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, there it is. It's right there. And it wasn't even, I wasn't even on my glute. I was on my, my inner thigh and I was like, oh shit. So I've been sitting on my foam roller every day for like five, 10 minutes. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to get this to move. And it's, it's amazing the difference. Like even just after working with Drew that one, that like the one time on Sunday, for the first time after that, I sat and I didn't feel pain in my lower back and in my upper glute. I was like, oh my God. Like yeah. for the first time in like weeks, I didn't feel that anymore. And I was yeah. like, that's it right there. That's it right It's a great there. example where I feel, you know, Drew and I have been doing this a really long time. And I wanted to be a physical therapist before I ever wanted to be mm -hmm. a coach. So my, mm -hmm. my aunt's a physical therapist. And clinicians so often now treat the area of pain, but yes. they're not finding the source of the pain. Mm -hmm. And that's why I have a really bad, big, big problem with like chiropractic and things like that. Because you just go in, it's like my back hurts. Cool. Boop, boop, boop. Send you on the way. See you next week. But when are we actually going to start treating the sources of pain, right? So right. you have a pain in your glute. You would have probably never thought it was your adductor, nope. <laughs> you know? No. Um, and, and we're starting to see, too, with all these assessments that Drew's doing that but, 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 uh, amongst the bikini girls, that everybody has pretty much the same issues. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's, it's it getting easier to treat and diagnose and, and, yeah. and, you know, come up with these things to, to help us. But, you know, now that's something that you can do 10 minutes before your workout and you're probably going to feel more activation just from simply foam rolling. Before oh, absolutely. Session. Yeah. That. And then like he was mentioning one of the reasons why I'm having issues too, is that it's almost, like my femur is like jammed into the socket and almost like it's from an impact thing. I was like, I don't do anything impact. Like I don't. So all I can think is it could be from when I was doing cardio during, during prep because I do run on the pavement sometimes. But I mean, that was in the fall. I mean, that was months and months ago, but I mean, it could just be an overtime kind of thing. So that's another thing that he showed me a few exercises to be able to pull that and open that up. And that's made a difference too. Just that alone, I can feel it opening. And it's not like a, it's not like a, like a specific, like I can feel it pop open or anything like that. But I can just feel it get stretched, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and those things, like you can see those kinds of imbalances, like when I'm in my poses and stuff, I tend to, I tend to be squished on the right hand side. And I, I mean, because I asked him, I was like, could this be from posing? He said, no, this is from impact. So it could be just a, a combination. I don't, I don't know, but it's that side where I pose. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, just, and just doing that and just kind of pulling and stretching that open has helped a lot too, just in the last couple of days, you know, um, Good. I trained glutes yesterday. Um, he just got me my new programming last night, but I got, I trained my glutes, my old program yesterday. I wanted to do it when I first got home. On Monday, but I was like, I'm not, I'm not fresh enough <laughs> to do this right now. Yeah, like, you I'm, took a red I'm eye. Tired. I took yeah, a red eye. Uh, yeah, you took yeah. a red eye. So. I didn't. I didn't sleep on that flight either. I like passed out for like maybe an hour between all the naps I took. You know what I mean? It's hard and, to sleep um, on a plane for me. Yeah, it's yeah. well that it's just like <laughs> I was on the aisle seat, which was fine, but the guy sitting next to me in the in the middle, middle seat was like laying on me. So I hate I'm that. like. I, and I feel that. bad because I know he doesn't know what he's doing. I know he's asleep. You know what I mean? And so I feel bad. I don't want to like shove him off me. But at the same time, I'm like, can you please get off me? <laughs> I'm like, this is a little, little awkward, a little awkward right here. <laughs> That's when I make a big move to like grab a water or something. I tried that a couple of times and he did. He moved and then he would fall back to sleep and go right back to the spot again. And I'm like, okay. It's just, it's just futile, you know Have I mean? you ever seen that um, thing? I, I feel like it was on Shark Tank or something. So it's literally like a, an attachment that goes from the back of the seat on an airplane to your forehead so you can lean into it and sleep like this. No. <laughs> I feel like that would be really weird. I think so too. <laughs> I, feel like I, don't, I don't feel like I would be comfortable doing that. <laughs> no, but it's for the mindful person that knows they fall asleep yeah. on a plane and their head goes yeah. this way. They want to go this way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, if, if you know that that's going to be an issue for you, yeah, be prepared for it, for sure. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't, so I didn't sleep, you know, and it was, only, it was really, it was only a three hour flight from Phoenix to Charlotte is where I, where I landed. And then Charlotte to DC was only like 45 minutes. That's really fast. So um, yeah, once I got home, <clears throat> I went straight into work when I got, when I got home. So I finished up with all that around two ish and then took a nap. So it was like, <laughs> I, didn't actually, I didn't actually go to the gym until late, which I don't like doing. It was packed. And I was like, 
no, I'm just going to do upper body. It's going to be easier for me to just, just knock something out. But yesterday I did do glutes. And, um, and again, I used the stuff that we went through. And it just activates everything in a whole new way. Um, and then plus, it's just the mental focus too. Like, you know, Dan was texting me um, business stuff while I'm in the gym. And he does it a lot. And I'm like, you just need to not do this right now because I can't concentrate on both things. <laughs> I was like, I was like, can we talk about this when I finish? Because I can't, I can't, I can't do both. Like, I'm literally like trying to focus on every little movement that I'm making right now. So when I left the gym, I was, I like, I could feel it in my glutes. I could feel how how much more it had taxed me. But I also felt it here. I was like, I need to go, I need to go to bed. <laughs> That's a really great point, actually. I mean, I just had one of my girls, one of my my athletes, she messaged me the other day, and I've been posting a lot of training footage, and she's like, I just have to ask, like, what are you thinking about during your sets? Because you just look so intense. Yeah. And I was like, honestly, I'm thinking about every freaking rep, like everything I'm feeling during that rep. And she was like, but how do you get to that point? Like, how do you get to the point of just being so focused in the session? I said, number one, you need to put your phone down. Like, put your phone on DND. Mm -hmm. Nothing is going to blow up in the hour that you're in the gym. Like, nothing. Yep. Nothing is going to yep. blow and if And if you're worried about something, then put your kids on the, you know, where it can come through your DND, right. whatever. But like, yep. get, your, get off your phone. And, like, even during rest breaks, I don't get back on my phone. I stay in the session. I'm like, I'm evaluating the last set I just did. How did it cool. feel? Was it too heavy? Could I go up? How many more reps could I have done? And I'm staying connected in the session. So yep. that each single set is very connected and intentional. That is the definition of intentional training. When, you're, when your trainer or your coach says, be intentional, that's mm -hmm. what they mean. They don't just mean mm -hmm. like go to the gym and show up and do your workout. It means every single set, every single rep, think about the intention and the lift behind it. Yep. And I did, uh, yesterday I did drop down all, almost all of my weights when I was, when I was training too, because I wanted to take the opportunity to connect it, you know, and if I'm thinking too much about pushing heavier, I'm not going to be able to mentally connect to whatever it is I'm doing. So I did drop down almost all of my weights yesterday just yep. to just be able to do that. So, um, there's something else I was going to mention about that too. And I can't remember. What oh yeah. So, so yeah. So after that, um, after I did my assessment with Drew, I did my, check-in posing for Jamie. Um, and like, that was the cool part too, because he sat in on that as well. And Jamie kind of communicated what she wanted to see happen with my physique. And then he, he told her what he's going to do with my programming, you know? So that was cool to have the two of them doing that. And this is going to go into the, into our talk today too. and kind of talking about the difference between being, you know, a gym rat and being an athlete. Like there's, they're two different things, you know, but that was fun. That was, for me, that was cool too, because I was like, they're taking a really invested interest in, in me and what I, what I need and what my body needs. Um, and it's going to be, I'm going to be honest, it's going to be hard because we're going from training six days a week to four. And I'm like, what am I going to do with those, those other days of the week that we're taking, getting rid of, you know, because the biggest thing for me, as you, as you know, my upper body is, is good. Like I don't, I don't need any more upper body. I'm, you know, came from figure that, that grew no problem. So they're keeping upper body in once just so that I'm stimulating it, but not growing it. Cause I don't need any more. And then the rest of it is going to be lower body legs and glutes. So I don't know what I'm going to do on my, <laughs> my two extra rest. Rest. that's all I'm going to tell you. I, gonna right. Do rest. Yes. That's, and, that's and right. And this is actually something really interesting that happened to Drew last week is we brought, we, we train at this really private facility here in Arizona um, and they don't necessarily like guest pass, but we asked him when the coaches were in town this weekend, if we could bring guests and we did. Well, Drew got in trouble because, you know, Drew is Drew and the girls were training and he ended up helping them and that's not allowed at this gym. Uh. And so the owner was watching the cameras and he noticed that Drew only did four exercises. And he, one of the owners, when he called us and he was like, hey, you can't do that, blah, blah, blah. One of the bullets in his gun to Drew was, you don't train hard enough. You only did four exercises. And Drew said, that's always how I train. Yeah. Like I only do four exercises, two failure, that's it. He goes, yeah. so you only do four exercises. He's like, yes, do you want to see my logbook? And he showed him his logbook. Like oh, wow. he did not believe us, but we really believe in like, you know, max six to seven exercises and really work failure through all of those exercises and that's where like this this idea of like heavy volume and you know things like that you see circling circling around the internet there is no reason for 12 to 15 exercises in a session at 12 to 15 reps there's yeah you're not good you're not going to be growing that way i'm just going to be yeah. very quiet. maybe for some people that's what they like and i yeah. would argue 
it's what they like because with the heavier reps, they're doing lighter weight. Yeah. And, you know, it's almost like a happy medium between the cardio bunny that joins a bodybuilding, you know, experience. And it's, you know, kind of the happy medium between those two. Yep. Uh, but yeah, less and more. And the idea is that you're only going to be training four days a week, but you're going so hard and intense on those days that you're going to need the other three days of rest. Yeah. Well, also, I think about the, the aspect, too, for myself. I mean, I'm 42 years old. You know what I mean? So as you get older, doing high volume like that isn't the best thing for you. Great point. You know? so having and protecting your recover. body. Mm-hmm. Recovery. Having more time Absolutely. to recover. Yep. So yep. And I still feel like I'm 22, but I'm not. <laughs> age is just a number, Sean. I know. No, I say, I say that all the time. Like, age is an attitude. It really is. I mean, at the end of the day. Um, there's, there's nothing saying that you can't do in your forties, what you can do in your twenties. It's just, you have, you have to do it a little differently. That's all, you know, that's just it. Have to, that's have it. To structure a little differently, you know, um, that's give it. yourself more time, give yourself more time to recover all those kinds of things. So, um, <clears> the <throat> same thing, my husband is turning 59 in a month, you know what I mean? And like, he doesn't train the same way he did when he was younger. I mean, it just, he would wreck himself if he did, you know? So we don't want that. He doesn't. He doesn't train at all right now. He's still recovering from surgery. But <laughs> that's what's killing him too. By the way, he's like, I can't stand that I can't work out. Oh, well, not yet. I mean, next time maybe you listen to me, and then you. <laughs> we got the video. We have the video. We have the video. It's still on my phone. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> So, you know, other than that, I'm looking forward to implementing all that. I'm going to start like kind of, I'm not going to do um, a lower body workout today because I just did it yesterday, but I am going to go ahead and, and kind of get started kind of working through the the workouts that Drew gave me so that I can figure out how to execute them properly once I actually start them. I might do upper body today, um, some cardio, that kind of thing. So Enjoy. I did kind of, I did kind of take off because I didn't work out when I was at the athlete summit. So I didn't work out on Friday. I didn't work out on Saturday. Um, Sunday I did the assessment with Drew, so kind of, sort of, but not really. Um, that's the longest I've taken off in a long time. <laughs> Probably felt nice. Yeah, I'm like, I feel good this week. I'm like, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, how awesome. about you? How, how's, how's your training going and all that? Good. Really good. Yeah, I took off the weekend too, and I'm super sore today. I actually did something to my shoulder yesterday. I can't really raise my shoulder, but I get body work done tomorrow, so hopefully we can figure that out. But I was actually a little nervous last night because I couldn't go through like passive range of motion, like my sh- shoulder wouldn't come oh. up. So, but I woke up this morning and it's feeling better. So, all's good. All's really, really good. Listen, I live with this man. Oh. <laughs> I live with the man 24 seven. So clearly he's, he's on my assessing ass for training. you all the time. Yeah. 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 Well, that was the thing. Like when he's sending me videos on how to do these exercises, it's all you doing them. <laughs> I'm like, poor girl. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, that's why part of the coaches summit was, you know, hopefully people being able to come back and like film some training videos, but yeah, volunteered. So like, I was like, I don't want all the training videos to be me. I want to get some other people in there. So now we're making a bank of more exercises and hopefully as athletes start flying out and or continue to fly out and things like that, we'll film them doing the exercises. So we have a little bit more variety. (laughs) I think also it's partly probably just being comfortable with it too, because I know, I know for myself, like I second guessed if I was doing things right, you've been working with them forever. So you know, you're doing it right. You know what I mean? I wouldn't want to be filmed doing it if I wasn't doing it correctly. You know what it's I mean? It's true. Especially with some of like the rotational stuff and things yeah. like that. Like I remember first doing them and I was so frustrated my first three weeks in my logbook. I had the assessment done by our general manager out in Florida, Javi. And I remember calling him week one and I'm like, I fucking hate this. So I was like, I have no clue what I'm doing. This is so different. He was like, okay, don't freak out. Don't freak out. Because yeah. at this point I already moved to Arizona. I did my assessment with him and then I moved the next week. That's right. Um, so I had to get on some FaceTime calls with him and things like that, but it is, it's tough. It's tough. So I love that you already said, like, I'm going to go through the logbook today and kind of start reviewing it and get ready for it. And that's what I do before every session, every single time I go through my logbook, I make like notes of like what I want to do that day or what weights I want to do or notes from last week. And just again, setting the intention of the training session. <laughs> right. And a lot of it's too, like working it through in your facilities too. You know what I mean? Like it's always Huge. different when you're at a different gym. And that's why I think we like as bodybuilders, we like to get into our routines too, because that's one less thing that we have to adjust, you know? Um, and that was something I mentioned to Drew yesterday too. I was like, everything that he's put into there, I can, I can do all of it. There's like two exercises that if I go to planet fitness, I don't have the equipment, but there, I do have the equipment at the shop. So it's not the a shop. deal. Yeah. Um, and regardless, I can figure it out. You know what I mean? So I can just make sure that that one workout, I make, make sure I don't do that at 
plant fitness or whatever, you know, but I just have to, those are the kinds of things I got to go through and figure out, you know. It's one of my points in our, in our subject today is about gym selection. <laughs> yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So, um, so let's go ahead and jump into it then. So going into, um, the, go ahead and mention the question. This is the question that, that you saw that you wanted to kind of address today. Well, I, was it a question? I saw two things. One thing I saw was on Reddit where someone said, hey, I'm l- looking to be a bodybuilder, but somebody tell me about the diet. Like how, mm-hmm. how tough is it? How much suffering is it? And then in the same day, one of my clients actually posted on her stories that she hadn't been posting for a while after she started this whole bodybuilding journey because she didn't realize how much time it was going to take. Um, so it brought me to this idea of talking about on the podcast, what does it actually take and what are the expectations and what are the, what, what do people tend to underestimate about this sport? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you see this girl in the gym that looks fantastic. You realize that she's a bodybuilder and then all of a sudden you get this notion that you want to do it too, but you have no idea about the sport, which is fair. That's how I came into the sport. That's how most people come into the sport. But then what happens is a lot of these girls start hiring coaches that maybe aren't the best to be taking them to stage and yeah. they're having this really tough experience. They mm-hmm. didn't realize everything that it was going to take, you know, because it wasn't communicated to them up front and it makes their prep suffer. And that also kind of turns them away from the sport. So I think there's some things that we could talk about today to kind of bring light to that if you're considering, you know, doing a show and, and, and things like that. Yeah. Well, one of the things I would like to start with in that in that regard is something that we've been doing is that we talk about being an athlete, right? A bikini athlete versus a bikini competitor. Those are two very different words. Um, and there's two very different things, in my opinion, too. I think a lot of people come into this thinking they're going to be a competitor. Well, what does that exactly mean? You know, yeah, you're getting on stage to compete, but that's one part of it. That's one little teeny tiny part of it. That is the end result of it. The rest of the time, you are an athlete. So you have to think about these things like what does an athlete do in order to be ready for competition, right? Like you would never say to um, a track athlete, you're a track competitor. No, they get on the track once to compete. The rest of the time they're training to be an athlete for that particular competition, right? So I think we need to kind of flip our mindset. I know when I came into the sport, it was more about getting up on stage and showing your, your physique and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. It wasn't really talked about as being bikini athletes, right? It was bikini models and all those kinds of things. And it was like, I want to look good in a bikini. I want to look good doing this. I want to look good doing that. Okay, looking good is part of it. But the industry has really shifted. And the women and men getting on stage are athletes, right? So if you start thinking about it in that respect, okay, we're going down this road of going on stage to compete. But you have to be an athlete first, Right. So like you were saying, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, gym trainers and coaches, things like that, that you, that you hired, that's what they are. They're gym trainers and coaches. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But did they ever train an elite athlete? I have this conversation with my, with my clients a lot. I'm like, did your coach ever train an elite athlete? Because you're now going into a sport where you're going to be an elite athlete. So you got to make sure that they can give you those kinds of those kinds of skill sets, those, that kind of training, um, that kind of background. They got to be able if they can train you in the gym as a lifestyle client, that's great. Can they level up their own skill as a trainer to train you when you get get up to the next level to be an athlete? There is a difference between being a lifestyle person in the gym and being an athlete in the gym. Those are two different Absolutely. things. Yeah. Two different things. So, and I'm not to say not saying that a gym trainer can't train elite athletes. They absolutely can, but are they willing to put the time in and get the education? Like what we did this past weekend, get more educated on that particular uh, sport that they're trying to train for. Are they willing to up their own game as a trainer and as a coach, or are they okay with just being a a gym trainer? And again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but what I'm saying is, is that if they're okay with being just a gym trainer, you got to realize if you want to be an elite athlete, you got to find somebody that can be an elite trainer. Right. So, you know, that would be um, what I would kind of liken Drew to, you know what I mean? I could go yeah. to a trainer here in the, in, in the DMV and stuff like that, but they don't focus on our sport like he would. Right. Yeah. So, you know, going into the sport, are you setting yourself up to be an elite athlete or are you setting yourself up just to get on stage and look good in a bikini? Yeah. 
you know, and it starts with the console call. It starts with that, that very first call and, and that communication with that client. One of the very first things I ask them after I look at their photos, I ask them for photos because I want to see what they look like to give them a, a proper estimate of what we're going to have to do to get to stage. And then I ask them what their goals are. Are you just trying to get up there for the first time in a sparkly bikini and get the photos and you're happy with any call out? Cool. It, mm-hmm. That's a different conversation than Jordan. I'm competitive. Yeah. If I walk away without a medal, I'm going to be upset. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the very first underestimates about this sport is how much muscle is in the bikini criteria. And 100%. when somebody signs up with me, I just did a console actually at the beginning of this week. And she's like, I've been training for two years and I want to do a bodybuilding show in four months. Okay. Sends me your photos, no glutes. Mm-hmm. So then I'm like, what, what are you training right now? Oh, I train six days a week. I do test and tries and then I do back and buys and I do one shoulder day and then I do one leg day and I train with my boyfriend. My boyfriend trains me. Uh. That's, that's a problem, right? That's why. Bikini criteria, you should not be training like your boyfriend. You should not right. be training like a man. Like you're, yep. you should be training very specifics, right? So it's always hard when I get on those calls because I'm the type of coach where I'm very black and white and I like to be very upfront and straightforward because at the mm-hmm. end of the day, the expectation is set by me. Right. So if I put an athlete on stage and they think that they're good enough to be in the first call out and they come off stage and they're not, they're going to be upset with, with that's me. Right. That's right. So I set the standard. Yeah. Hey, listen, you're signing up for a bodybuilding show, even though we're in the bikini criteria, which is the smaller, smallest muscular category. These women are still jacked, they are. even at the amateur level. Yeah. I mean, some of the best shows last year, I saw some great talent last year. And, you know, these girls in the gym as well, especially when, when a girl that is considering competing is watching a girl that is dieting down in the gym and getting the notion that she wants to do this, doesn't realize that that girl is dieted down, she's flat, so she yep. looks small. Yeah. But when yeah. she starts to fill back out again and she gets that muscle, she gets that fullness, they, and we pose it so well, they don't see what it actually takes for that muscular build. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times on my console calls, it's kind of a letdown because you know, this girl on Monday, she thinks that she's going to, she's going to be prepping in four months. And I'm like, Hey, you could prep in four months with another coach. It's just not going to be me. Yeah. Um, And also too, she's coming to me at 1600 calories, Mm -hmm. already doing 45 minutes of cardio, seven days a week. Where do I go from there? How how do I put you through a 20 week long prep with, already 1600 calories and 45 minutes of cardio a day. This is where another coach would interview her and go, I'll take your money and I'll take you to see. And now, you know, six weeks out from show, she's on 800 calories and three hours of cardio a day and talking to the other girls backstage that didn't have to diet down that much because they took some time on the front end to get healthy and to reverse diet and to put on muscle and things like that. I had, again, same, same concept. I had a call this week um, with a girl who wants to get on stage in August. And I said, you know, that's, that's great. I said, but let me ask you a question. I said, if we get into this and we start realizing you actually need a little bit more time um, to be uh, to get on stage, do you want to just get on stage or do you want to be competitive when you get on stage? And she said, no, I want to be competitive. I said, so are you okay with taking that extra time? She said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely okay with taking that extra time. Great. Awesome. That can give us something to work with, you know, because you're right. A lot of times they come into the sport, like our topic today, thinking I can just diet for four months and jump on stage. You can but that doesn't mean that you're going to be in a good spot when you do it. Right. So a lot of times you have to reassess. And sometimes this is something going back to when you're first starting to work with a coach too. It's like the first, you know, month, six weeks, eight weeks or so should be kind of figuring out where your base start point is. You know, we don't know for sure. You can sit there and say, Oh, I've been tracking my calories and my expenditure and all this kind of stuff. But when we really dig into it, have you been, I know I wasn't when I first started, I thought I was, And here I am, I've been in the industry forever and I thought I was tracking everything. I wasn't, you know, like when I started actually diving into it, it's like, oh no, actually I thought I was taking in 1900 calories a day. I wasn't, I was taking in 17. (laughs) Like I thought I was doing hard cardio. I wasn't, I was just walking, you know, those things make a difference. And then we don't really know that until we sit down and start analyzing those things and say, okay, in reality, we're here and we need to be here, you know? So those are the things that, that, that people think they're doing a good job right now. They think that they're doing a good job. On the flip side of that, I had another consult with a girl. She's like, I'm at my lowest right now. She's like, as far as her worst shape is what she felt like. Uh, she's like, I've done this uh, training stuff before. She's like, I've done a mock competition prep before. She's like, I didn't actually get on stage. She's like, but I, I've done the mock, the mock prep before. She goes, so I know what it's all about. 
She goes, I'm going to be honest. I completely fell off everything. And I know that there's no place but up from here. <laughs> she's like, but she's, she has a realistic expectation of, I understand this is probably going to take me over a year to get to where I want I'd to be. I'd rather that. Yeah. I'd rather that. hundred percent. hundred percent. She's like, I figure where I'm sitting right now, I can't get any, <laughs> she's like, I can't get any worse. It can only go up from here. And I was like, I love that. <laughs> You know? That's something to work with, though. That's something <laughs> yeah. I actually love that as a, char- a character trait in bodybuilding. Yeah, you're realistic with yourself. You're able to look at yourself and assess yourself in a very honest manner, and then you're yep. able to verbalize it to someone that you've met on a on a call for ten minutes and be yep. vulnerable with that person. That's right. That to me is the start of a great coaching relationship. Mm-hmm. I can work with. I agree. I, I can work with that. I can't yep. work with the person that is gung ho about seeing a girl in the gym three days ago doing a bikini competition, and now she thinks she could do one in four months. Right. That's harder for me. That's a, yep. that's a, that, that, that's a lot harder to deal with. So, and that's something I agree. you have to take into a comp- into con- uh, consideration when you're coming into the show, like you said before too, because they could have just that person that you saw in the gym that's on you know three hours of cardio a day or whatever it might be. They could have gone to a coach and said, "I just want to get on stage." That coach took them, like you mentioned, and so they're killing themselves in order to get up on stage. So you think that's just what you have to do? That is not what you have to do. They're coming at it. Patient. Yep. They're coming at it from a standpoint of I'm I'm a bikini competitor versus I'm a bikini athlete. Yeah. And this is where coaches get a lot of bad reps, right? Because yes. now in four months from now, that girl's backstage and she's talking to another competitor and she's like, oh man, I'm suffering. I'm on 800 calories a day and I'm on two and a half hour cardio, blah, blah, blah. But remember back to your consult call four months ago when you said, I'm willing to do anything. I don't need to do a reverse diet. I don't need to put on my arm muscle. I just want to get on stage. Mm-hmm. Now we're here. You know, mm-hmm. so, you know, they're going to blame the coach, but really they need to look thinking back to that first consult. Now, mm-hmm. if the coach didn't say anything and they're just like, yeah, we could do this. Obviously context matters here, but it's important to realize that sometimes the coach has to do what they have to do. If, yeah. if that's what they're going to take. Yeah. I like to like that night knowing all my athletes are healthy and yeah. that I did everything I could to put them in the best position possible. So I will never have an athlete that will say that because yeah. I don't do that. Yeah. Um, but it's true. And also something that people underestimate too, is that the more lean muscle tissue that you have, the less you have to diet down, you know, the less muscle you have, you have to show up in shape, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to show up in shape without muscle, unfortunately, you just have to show up skinny, which, you know, if that's your choice, that's your choice, but skinny is not a good look at bodybuilding and it's not awarded, but you're going to, you can't, you can't show up with body fat on you. So the only thing that we can do is severely cut you down to skin and bones basically. And that's not a good look either. You know, at the end of the day, if you take some time just to put on a little bit more tissue to get your macros into a good spot, to pull your cardio down, to spend a few months getting your coach established with you, that was a great point, Sean. You know, we're, we're, we're great at what we do, but we're not magicians. You know, the body is very erratic. We have science and then we have what actually happens. So yep. taking some time for your coach to get to know you and how your body ticks and what it likes and what it doesn't is all valuable information mm-hmm. that will help in a prep to ease the, the suffering. Yep. But something that is also underestimated is no matter what you do at any point in a prep, you're going to suffer. That's right. It's not a comfortable sport. Yeah. We have to think We have to think 99% of America is overweight and out of shape. Mm-hmm. These bikini girls don't just get on stage with a bunch of muscle and lean on accident. No. This is why most people aren't in shape. Just just in shape as a lifestyle person, right? So there is going to be some form of suffering, and mm-hmm. there is going to be a time where you get hungry. There's yep. no way, no matter how high your calories are, because it's all relative. If I start yep. at 2,500 calories and I cut down to 1,800, I'm going to be hungry, hungry. at 1,800. If there's another girl at 1,800 and she cuts down to 1,200, she's going to be hungry at 1,200. Mm-hmm. That's where people the 10 percent rise that's what mm-hmm. i always say when it's hung when you're hungry when your body doesn't feel good when recovery shit because you know you're to have such high cardio food is so low if you can continue there that's where you're gonna rise mm-hmm. or some people are going to remove themselves from the sport and never come back again because they can't get through the suffering which is okay but yep. that's the hardest part of the sport and i think some people are like well how do i not suffer and how do i not get hungry you can do that you're just going to show up out of shape yep well, then there's the flip side of that. And I think some people actually use the suffering as a badge of honor. They say, well, I did it. And I, I did this on 700 calories a day. I did three, three hours of cardio, blah, 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 blah. That's what I have to do. But I'm like, yeah, I did it. Blah, blah. Okay, cool. Here's your, here's your, here's your little gold star. <laughs> you know, at, at the end of the day, what did you really do? That's not competition. That's not bikini competition. But some people do it. Some, yep. some athletes do it. Some coaches do it. 
I see I this now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, we I, I see this now, and um, she was a former Miss Bikini Olympia, and she's now on Instagram dogging the sport all the time and talking about how she had to suffer like this. I'm like, but that's not how we all do it. <laughs> I'm, like, Absolutely. I'm like, maybe you did it that way. Maybe that's the direction you went, but that is not the sport in general. You just had shitty coaches. Absolutely. And that was, the, you know, and again, this is a different time frame. This was years ago when she, when she was, you know, holding that title and everything. So things were different. And I get that. I understand that, but that's not a reason to bash the sport now because we, again, have a lot more education. Now we have a lot more tools in our tool toolbox to use. Now it's not like that. You know, it's not like that anymore. And I'm sorry that you had that experience. You just said you had that experience. I had that experience, but we learned from it, right? Yeah. We learn from it and it's okay. Like we all screw up at one point or another. It is what it is. But the point is, is that we learn from it and we don't do that again. We figure out there's got to be a better way to do this. There's you a pivot. reason why. Yeah. There's a reason why four years ago, almost I hired Jamie because I said to myself, there's got to be a better way to do this. So I'm not sitting here saying that, that I was perfect from the get-go. I was not. I did all this all this shit. So trust me. <laughs> like, well, I know. I got to the point where I felt like I was going to break in half because I was so skinny. You know what I mean? But the point is, is that you pivot and you learn from it. And you realize, again, we're not doing this to compete. We're doing this to be an athlete. We're doing this to become the best possible version of ourselves. And that's why we're doing all these things. Um, another example that I saw, again, on a Facebook group the other, like last week or so, girl was getting frustrated with her coach. She just hired a new coach um, for an off-season program with this particular coach. And she was honest in the in the post that she put up and said that she was not sticking to her plan 100%. Um, she said, but it's off-season. I shouldn't have to stick to a meal plan. I shouldn't have to do this. And I shouldn't have to do that. And so my coach is getting upset with me and he said that he can't he can't train me if I'm going to be like this. And, and I don't think that that's correct. I said, listen, I said, first of all, I said, you just signed up with this guy like a month ago, right? I said, you're not giving him an opportunity to learn anything about you if you're not sticking to his plan. You know, yeah, you may go down the road with him and he gives you a little bit more autonomy, a little bit more freedom to choose what you want to do. And you don't have to be 100% on the plan anymore. But he specifically, even by her own words, specifically told her she needed to be on plan 100% at first so he could figure out what was going on with her with her body. And I understand off season, it's there so you can have a little bit more leniency. But if you're trying to have a coach can only do what information you give to that coach you can only do with it what you give to him. So if you're giving him incomplete information or incorrect information or you're not actually sticking to a plan, he can't do anything. Right. He's his, his hands are tied because he doesn't know any actual information. I said, now listen, I said, could he have communicated this better with you? Probably, yeah, based on how she put it up. He, he probably could have said it a little bit better, but he, you can clearly tell he's frustrated. You know, as a coach, somebody that wants to help you, that wants to make you better, it's frustrating if you don't stick to the plan. Yeah. And not one week, but when it's, you know, when I tell, tell people, when you keep checking in with me and you keep re responding with the same response of yeah. why you didn't hit your plan at some point you have to then take responsibility for yourself right. and say i'm choosing not to follow my plan and right. i would rather someone say that to me in their check-in than oh this happened and oh my husband did this so i couldn't prep my food this week and oh yeah. this surprise well no, you chose to not you know be on plan and yeah it's true you know as a coach and, and in the off season there needs to be flexibility like yes. as coaches we need to give flexibility to our clients that they have that mental freedom and they don't feel like they need to be off plan like jamie gives me a good enough flexibility right now that 95 percent of the time i stick to my meal plan yeah. but that other five to ten percent of the time i get some i get some free meals and yeah. i get some time off and that's what the off season's for but if you're off all all the time seven days a week don't hire a coach at that point because we right. can't do anything for you. Right. We, we, we cannot do anything for you if you're not giving us some sort of data or sort, some sort of consistency so we know how your body's responding. Yep. I listen to Drew all the time on calls with clients and they're like, well, change the can, can we change the plan? And Drew's like, there's nothing that I can change. Yeah. I just need you to stick to this plan for more than one day so I can yeah. see how your body responds. The last thing I want to do is increase food and then now you're having a surplus of food and we're putting on body fat or decrease your food and make you so hungry and not have you you know have energy and recovery in your lifts i just need to stick to here so i know where yes. we're at yes absolutely you know that, and that's the thing it's like you know i, I going getting back to this example it's like i understand his frustration you know if you're a good coach and you want to see your athlete do well 
you want to have all the possible like boxes checked, you know, because that gives you a complete package, complete picture. And you can say, I can, I can work with this and I can tell you how to progress yeah. because even when you've got all those boxes checked, there's still going to be things that are out of our control, hormonal fluctuations and things like that. You know, good example for me this past weekend, right? I didn't go to the bathroom the entire time I was in Phoenix. <laughs> The entire time I had, I was in so much pain. I got, and I still got in my bikini and I still posed for Jamie and Drew after not having to go to the ba- be able to go to the bathroom since Thursday. I did this on wow. Sunday. So I was like, by the way, you guys, <laughs> just so you know, I was like, this is normally not here. Um, and then I got home and literally, like, I'm not even lying, this happened in the airport. When I got to the airport in DC, I went to the bathroom. And that happens like, to me all the time. It's like your body knows. <laughs> I was like, what yeah. the hell? And I messaged Jamie. I was like, is that, I'm like, I don't understand it. Like, I don't get like, what? I'm like, if it's the flying part, that's a problem. Then why it's your am I, brain. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what she said. She was like, she's like, it's your, it's your, it's your brain. She's like, it's, it's more psychological than anything else. And I'm like, cause yeah. I was trying so hard to go to the bathroom all weekend in Phoenix and it wasn't happening. It was yeah. driving me crazy. And then as soon as I was like, oh, well, it's over now. <laughs> It's like, okay, we're going to release everything now for you. It happens to me all the time (laughs) with traveling. It's so frustrating, man, because I was like, I kept my water up. I did all the things you're supposed to do. My body didn't even have to get home. You just, your body literally did not even get home. home. Yeah. 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 I was like, all right, cool. I was like, we're good now. I feel great. (laughs) Of course, when you land. Yeah. So I was over. Well, that goes back to the, the aspect of I did everything right. I did everything I was supposed to do. My body just didn't want to have it. It was like, nope, we're not, we're not, we're not going to release anything for you today. No. Nope. Nope. So, you know, as, as much as you want to check all those boxes, um, sometimes you have to, you have to just go with what your body wants to do too. Um, so you were saying something about training environment too, like um, gyms and things like that. So what was your point on that? What did you want to depend on? Yeah. So, I mean, I think with bodybuilding and especially with the bikini criteria, there are very specific exercises and movements that we have to do in order to grow certain body parts or limit others and things like that. And I uh, get calls all the time about girls that are out of Planet Fitness or Mm -hmm. training in their garage gym. And they have trouble with doing the specific movements that I need them to do due to lack of equipment. Mm -hmm. And so one of the biggest questions is, can I do things from my home gym? Well, it depends. It depends on what you have access to and things like that. For a client like that, sometimes I try to meet them in the middle, like, hey, can you go find a gym that maybe you could do both of your lower body days in, and then we'll do all of your upper body days in your garage gym. Um, So I just think there's this like underestimation of, again, what it takes to build there, there, you know, we are in a bodybuilding sport. And I think that there's such a limit on the training aspect, especially with coaches of like looking at just simply looking at training footage. Like that is the biggest piece of our sport. I have a client that I just started recently working with and she was committed to her home gym. I didn't want her to do it, but that's what we did for the first month. And then finally she realized she wasn't growing. Mm-hmm. And she went to an, a, a commercial gym just to see if it was any different for her. But not not only was she more sore because she was working on actual training equipment. That's great. What she said is the environment was everything. Actually yeah. being in with other people. And even though you're not conversating, just the environment and the energy within the gym want, made her want to push more. Absolutely. And that's really what is needed, in my opinion, for longevity in this sport and that's how you also not get um secluded within this sport it's a very it's a very uh, lonely sport at times and there's not a lot of people obviously that do it around you so the gym and your people at the gym is really kind of what keeps you keeps you disciplined and keeps you coming back so she has now grown exponentially from there's no changes to my training plan. There's no changes to the sets and reps or the concept behind it. It's just her mentality now walking into the gym and working on these pieces of equipment. So I think, you know, too, I had another client that was training at like a planet fitness or a crunch or something like that. And she went to more of a private gym and she said she had just a better workout just from the more private gym, just from again, the environment environment is everything. And if you're not getting what you need out of where you're at right now, you have control, switch it. Yes. Go find another gym. Go find a training partner. Go get Mm -hmm. get something that's going to make your experience better. Yes. Well, and I say that too because I do go to Planet Fitness myself. And I try to go prior to it getting really busy because when it gets really busy, I can't focus on anything. 
like this just happened the other day. I'm sitting there, you know, on the cable pull through and everything. And the kid walks behind me and smacks me with a bar as he walks by me. And like, doesn't say a word, just keeps walking. I was like, bro, you literally just fucking hit me. And that kind of stuff happens all the time in there because people just don't know what they're doing. They're not paying attention. And honestly, my brain goes to that kind of thing all the time. Like that guy's going to hit me. That guy's going to hurt me. That guy's going to drop his weight on top of me. Like that. I think about those things all the time when I'm walking around that gym because that, that it happens. And it, like I said, it finally did the other day with a guy freaking hit me with the bar. And he acted like it wasn't like it didn't even happen. I was like, what the hell, dude? <laughs> no, I was like, and, it's, and again, it's, and I hate to say it, but it's young kids. They've never been in a gym before in their life. They don't know what they're doing and nobody helps them. Nobody tells them what to do. So they're just wandering, meandering around the place. And I'm like, bro, like you see me sitting here pulling on this weight and you're smacking me with shit. The same thing I was on the um, glute press down thing, whatever. In the middle of my set, a kid comes up and walks up to me and says, how much more do you have to do? I'm like, I'm in the middle of a set. In That's the middle of it. <laughs> That's my peppy. <laughs> I'm like, I'm literally pushing down on this right now. <laughs> like, stop. Like, and it's, again, it's just stupid little things like that knocks you out of your box. Yeah. Knocks you out of your concentration. Knocks you out of, like we were talking at the beginning of this, how much I have to now concentrate on what I'm doing. I can't, I can't focus on that kid that's going to hit me with a bar. You yeah. know, and going back to being an athlete, you know, if you were a tennis player or a bowler, you know, a sport with equipment, you would yeah. be buying the best equipment that yeah. you can with you, with the money you can buy. That's yeah. your gym membership in our sport. That's right. That is your equipment. Mm -hmm. So use your money to buy within a gym that you feel comfortable with, that you know you can grow in, and don't cheap out on that. That's Absolutely. where you're going to improvements to be competitive if that's your what what you want out of this. Mm -hmm. Yep. That. And then also going on to the environment aspect of going to shows and going to posing clinics and going to events in your area that are done through, you know, MBCI, PB and stuff like that too. That gets you around people that have your same goal. And again, gives you the mindset, gives you the environment, gives you those things that say, okay, this is going to help me push to the next thing. Right. Yeah. So those things I think are important too. It's again about your environment. It's about where you are. And then you can also see you can go talk to people that have been in the sport for forever because maybe your coach is the, your typical gym coach. Again, no, no problem with that. But if that person hasn't been coaching for but a year, you need to be around people that have been around this for a little bit longer so that you yeah. understand the criteria. You yeah. know, I, I go back to, I had a, I had a coach that was a gym tra trainer and he was great as far as the conditioning is concerned and things like that, but he didn't know what he was looking at. Like I saw myself and you know, being in the, in, in the sport, when you get into prep, you can't see yourself clearly. I could see myself clearer than he could see me, you know, wow. and if you, you know, if you've got, if you've got a coach that can't see what you're supposed to be putting on stage, you're shooting yourself in the foot. It's a waste of money. It's a waste yeah. of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, when you decide to do a, you know, you're an avid lifter, let's say for a year, couple years, or, you know, you're, you know, doing some beach body programs and you're doing these 30 minute sessions, but you're consistent. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you switch to bodybuilding, you know, it's that next level of elite, yes. you know, and, and you unfortunately probably cannot do what you've been doing up until this point. Right. You know, again, raising the bar for yourself. You're going to this next elite status. So I think too, people get so comfortable with where they're at and they're like, Oh, you know, I've been doing beach body workouts, 30 minutes, six days a week. So now I'm ready for a bodybuilding competition. And they just think that that same level of, you know, workouts and consistency is going to kind of get them to that next level. Yep. But it's not, it's you not. Know, there needs more, more and more in the higher the ranks that you go. Um, so it's just about kind of finding and being honest with yourself on that. What's needed, yes. you know, and being able to level up. If you yep. choose the sport, you got to be able to level up and get uncomfortable. Yep. Well, you, you can go back to major sports. You know, when, when guys get into the NFL, they have strength and conditioning coaches. They have skill coaches. They have the offensive coach, defensive coach. They have a head coach, but they have people to take care of everything else, too, because they are now at an elite status. You know, things that they didn't have when they were in high school, you know, completely different. So yeah. you have to remember all of that. Like, if you want to be a professional athlete – you have to you have to do it as if you were a professional athlete. Exactly. Exactly. Bottom line. Bottom line. Yep. Um, anything else that you want to touch on in this particular topic as far as what you underestimate? I was and I, again I would go back to that concept of be being open and being willing to pivot based on you know where you are and what your coach wants wants to do with you. And understand you do not have to be at seven hundred calories and three three hours of cardio a day in order to make it successful. If you choose to be there, that's on you. You know, that's on you. And that's not going to be your best package. It's not going to be your best package. So take the, the opportunity to 
grow as an athlete. And again, yeah. be an athlete versus a competitor. Those are two different things. Yeah. Right? Give yourself time. Give yourself patience. And yeah, be an athlete, right? Feel your body yeah. the right way with nutrient-dense full foods, you know, especially for someone on macros. Macros are a great tool, especially for the off-season, but that doesn't mean that you have to choose foods that are shit, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Fuel your body like an athlete. Put your brain in the position of an athlete. Train yep. like an athlete. Like, be a professional. Yep. You know, if you want to go pro, start at being acting like a pro as an amateur. That's yep. how you're going to turn pro. Yep. Um, there's all these, you know, I always say it's it's what you do when no one's watching. That's mm-hmm. what's going to amount to success. When no one's watching, do you grab for an extra handful of this? Or do you, you know, grab for this food instead of this food? All of the choices amount up at the end of the week, end of the month, end of the year. Um, so, yeah. If, if you're wanting to be in this sport, great. Welcome. And you yep. can do it. Like Absolutely. Get ready to level up. Absolutely. And change. Yeah. Okay. So let's get on to something that is a current event in our sport right now. Uh, this popped up this week and it was all the rage all over social media. And it is this, which let me, there we go. Uh, okay. Men's wellness. <laughs> So this popped up, I think it was Monday, Monday morning or something like that. I'm not really sure. Um, but this was a competitor in Brazil. Um, it is a male competing in wellness. Um, and everybody lost their minds. Everybody lost not, their minds. Not wellness, but it was a separate category, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Everybody, everybody absolutely lost their minds, but it, that's what they're calling it. They're calling it men's wellness. And again, they're, wellness. Call, they're calling it men's wellness. It is not female He's not competing against women. That is not happening. This is an actual division, but it is not. Um, it is not. Try to get rid of this thing. Hide. There we go. There we go. Uh, it is not in the NPC and IFBB. It is not a part of our federation. It is not. It's just a random promoter in Brazil that is testing this particular division. Um, first of all, I think he looks phenomenal. Um, I don't see this ever coming to the NPC or IFBB. Uh, I maybe in a few little, you know, random federations in Brazil, this is, this will be a thing. Cause down, you got to remember that in Brazil, you know, the trans community and things like that, um, all that stuff is a lot more, it's not as, as much of a minority as it is here in the States. It's, it's a lot more socially acceptable there than it is here. So they feel there could be a need for it there. There's not here. Um, you got to remember that when you come back to the, the sport and the divisions and things like that, it is all about what is going to bring in more competitors and more money. And I don't know anybody that would compete in this here in the States. I'm just going to be honest. I don't know a single person that would compete in this in the States. I don't know who looks this damn good in the States. Right? <laughs> I was going to say that. That was going to be my next thing. I don't know anybody that looks like this. I mean, he looks phenomenal. Absolutely. Good for him. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But, you know, people were freaking freaking out saying, oh, all this woke bullshit and everything. I'm like, guys, like this is a person that's expressing how they want to showcase their physique. It is one person one person in the entire world, there may be a handful of others that would like to do this. If they find it's viable down there, cool. You know, who cares? How is this hurting you? Mm -hmm. How is this hurting you? It's not hurting you. That's the first thing. It's not. Nothing about this is hurting you. Um, And the second thing is, is like this stuff happens all the time. I'm saying I'm liking this to drag, you know, guys dress and drag all the damn time. And it's a whole other business, but you would never think that a drag queen is trying to compete with an actual beauty queen, you know what I mean? It's two completely different genres and it's their own type of self-expression. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit with this particular um, to- showcase topic is that bodybuilding is the one federation, I'm gonna get the or one federation, the one, the one sport where if a man was to compete against a woman, he is at a disadvantage because Men are just structurally put together differently than women are. Okay, I've seen this actually happen at shows. I've seen trans athletes compete um, in, in female categories, and nine times out of ten, they are placing last in their category. And the reason for that is because structurally, bone structure, the way that they are put together, they are put together as a biological male. Now, hormones and things like that can help them start to do the transition and all of that, which is totally fine, but your still bone structure is 
male, which is more boxy. It's not curvy. There's a reason why a lot of these people that go through the transition do as many plastic surgeries as they do. They have to in order to be able to, to get to that kind of look. So, and that doesn't fly in bodybuilding. It doesn't fly in bodybuilding. You can't do uh, glute implants in bodybuilding. You can't do all those things that you could do as a normal person to transition. It shows up on stage. So yeah. the kind of outrage that people have over this, this is the one sport where I say, I mean, have at it because it's actually going to make it more difficult for you. I'm just going to be honest. It's going to make it more difficult. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on, on this whole process and this whole subject? I agree with everything you said. I mean, I don't really have an opinion either way, to be honest. Yeah. I just, you know, Tyler came on and basically said there are no new federations being added to the NPC IFBB. So we know this isn't coming anywhere. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's not hurting anyone. I think he looks fantastic. I think he looks Absolutely. better than, than some wellness competitors in the state. So, Agreed. like I said, good for him. I mean, I think I think it's amazing. I, You know, at the end of the day, bodybuilding is about showcasing our hard work in the gym. And right. he should be able to do that, too. So That's right. I do have one gripe. I have one gripe about the whole thing he didn't have to wear heels <laughs> like what the hell he didn't <laughs> like, that's no right. he was in barefoot i was like that's right i could look that damn good posing in barefoot too <laughs> this is the men's wellness federation <laughs> right. or, or, uh, category. <laughs> i was like like man i said a little time i'm like i would love to do women's physique just because i wouldn't have to wear heels i could dance the on the stage <laughs> that's the worst part second like, yeah, can. You know, at the end of the day, I'm like, I think that there's a place for everybody. I think there's a place for everybody to be able to, like you said, showcase their hard work on stage. Um, and this is, again, the one sport where, you know, transitioning into a different se uh, biological sex is not going to be an adva advantage for you. It's just not. Um, because it's about aesthetics. It's not about performance. You know, performance okay. is one thing. This is the look and the overall shape. And bottom line is, is men are shaped differently than women are when they're born. It just is what it is. So um, you can go through all the all the plastic, plastic surgeries and hormones uh, and things like that, um, but it's not going to make you more competitive uh, once you get on stage. Because at the end of the day, when you look at it from just from a, a biological standpoint, uh, you go through those plastic surgeries as a female competing against other females, and some of those are going to get you docked on stage too. Right. We talk about right. the gluten implants and things like that. You will be last of last yes. if you if you have those things um, done to yourself. So it's the same concept here. So at the Absolutely. end of the day, at the end of the day, have fun, you know, and promise you the NPC and the IPB is not going to add this division because I just don't think there's a big enough interest to it for it. At the end of the day, they're, they're just not, there's, there's not any money in it. We got plenty. We're, we're good. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're good. We got, we got enough. Well, we talked about this before. We want a bikini model division too, but you know, that's, that's a whole other topic. We talked about that several times. So, um, but yeah, we're good. So I say more power to them. I loved the suit color choice too. I'm just going to say the suit cut and color was beautiful. So posing was phenomenal. So I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> Sean's like, I like his suit. <laughs> I know, right? I was like, oh, it's a pretty color. Hair and makeup was good. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love that. Uh, all right. So let's get into a few uh, questions from listeners. So the first one I'm going to pop up here is um, your opinion on doing a mini cut. What's your opinions on mini cuts? Is there any context around that question? This or is that's the, just... This was it that was just uh, popped in there. So maybe give a, a, a for instance, an example. Okay. Um, yeah. Mini cuts obviously serve a time and a place, but uh, context is needed. Um, I use mini cuts maybe in a really, really deep off season. If, you know, somebody maybe had a um, bad reverse or they're just getting a little bit uncomfortable and we know that we're taking a longer time away from stage, we'll do a mini cut, which is about anywhere from eight to 12 weeks, depending on how the body's responding or how aggressive that you want to take that cut. Um, and it's really good for two purposes. I usually use it for number one, obviously to pull body fat off and kind of see what's underneath, what kind of lean muscle we have, where we need to, you know, continue to grow or shape or things like that and number two to use the rebound um so you know if somebody in a deep off season is maybe having trouble with hunger cues um or i need them to they're natural and i need them to have some sort of trajectory to grow again i'll cut them down to get them hungrier number one and then number two use the rebound or that reverse phase to be able to stimulate the body for a little bit more lean tissue growth um most of the time, though, I don't want to do many cuts if I don't have to, you know, yeah. because you have to think that eight to 12 weeks is um, putting you behind on growth, you know. So, again, context matters. There's a time and a place. But those are really the, the, the reasons I would use it. 
So that would that was be my next question for you. I agree with all of that. Um, when would you say it's a bad idea to do a mini cut? When you're not as fat as you think you are <laughs> and you need more time to grow. You know, okay. at, at some point as an amateur in this sport, you're going to have to have one to two really uncomfortable off seasons where you're sitting 20 to 25 pounds over stage weight and that's just what it is. Um, but if, if you need more time to grow and you're leaner than you think you are, then just stay in your growing phase, yeah. stay in the growing phase and keep using that time. Um, yeah, I think people use mini cuts, you know, just to kind of get a little bit more comfortable when they feel like they're in their head about how they look and yeah. they think they look worse than they actually are. Yeah. Um, so then they just keep prolonging their time for growing anyways. Yeah. I see that all the time too. Like I, you know, doing what we do, we're in front of the camera a lot. You know what I mean? So it's like, there's some days where I just feel like I'm having a bleh day, you know, like this weekend, I can go to the bathroom. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, bleh. but then you look at photos and you're like, actually, that's not that bad. You know what I mean? Like, I was looking at my, my pictures of it on Sunday. I was like, my stomach's still flat. I was like, my, my legs look full, you know, those kinds of things. Sometimes it's just a matter of kind of checking yourself yeah. and, you know, giving yourself a reality check in a good way and say, listen, I'm really not that far gone, you know? Yeah. Um, You're always going to think that you look worse than you actually do. Yeah. Like in your yeah. own brain, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, something else that helps me with that too, when you're starting to feel that is looking back at old progress photos um, I know for myself, I go and trainerize a lot and I'll, I'll go into my old off seasons and look at my weights, look at my measurements and look at my photos and see where I was. You know, I, I try to compare similar weights and things like that, see what my body, my body looks like. I just did this, that this past week. I'm like, oh, my weight's the same as I was, you know, back this summer that I was the same weight this summer, right before we started prep. And I'm looking at the shape of my overall muscle and everything. And I'm like, damn, I, but I put on some really good density. You know, I put on some good size, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so I'm, I'm good. Like those are the things that keep me in check as far as I don't, I don't feel like I, I need to take that weight off. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, um, so I think that a lot of times, like you said, a lot of times it's more here than anywhere else that needs to be checked before we go into a mini cut. Yeah. Um, now you could, I, I would say one other argument for a mini cut is to see, like, like you said, kind of see how your body's going to respond and how much you've got like underneath there, that kind of thing. But like you said, I mean, what's the point in cutting if we're still trying to grow, you know, you're just, you're just, you're just wasting time really because you're yeah, going to, I mean, but if an athlete's like, Hey Jordan, like I'm, I'm committed to 16 months to two years in an off season, yeah. then we can have more time for me. Yeah. 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 I yeah. Get that, you know, Hey, can we grow for six months? Then I want to go on this vacation in nine. Yeah. So can we cut, you know, in between the vacation? Yeah, absolutely. As long as yeah. you're committed to a long term off season. But if you're not, we're on a timeline and you want to get on stage sooner rather than later, just stay in your off season as long as you can and grow, 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 get your calories up, get a little bit uncomfortable. And then that way, you know, your prep's going to be easier. It goes back yeah. to everything we just talked about earlier on this morning. And to also um, tag onto that too, is that just because you do a mini cut and your body responded one way during that mini cut doesn't mean it's going to respond that way when you go to prep. No. It's Metabolism not, it's not is ever, is always changing. Metabolism yeah. is very Active, it's always changing, which is why it's important to get your calories as high as possible, yeah. especially if you know you're going to be cutting for 24 to you know 20, over 20 weeks. You're gonna need right. wiggle room to get yep. stage lean, absolutely. So, so the bottom line is sometimes it depends. That's, it depends. that's the answer on that question, <laughs> yep. like, most, like most questions in this sport. It depends. Yep, it depends. <laughs> um, next question that we'll go into this is a really quick one because this was a comment that came in um, on our video in regard to our posing do's and don'ts. Um, that we only do our routines once in the NPC. This particular listener uh, was upset that she only got to do her routine once, um, usually during pre-judging, sometimes, depending on the show, sometimes you do your routine at finals, but it's usually during pre-judging. No matter how many classes you do, you only do your routine once. This is across the board. This is every single show that you will go into from amateurs all the way up to a lot of the pro shows now too. A lot of the pro shows do not allow you to do your routine both at, at pre-judging and at finals. So going back to what we were talking about in that posing uh, podcast, which was two podcasts ago, if you guys haven't listened to it, um, comparisons are compar are imperative because that's where you're being judged. You know, So if you are a new athlete, say you're doing three, three um, divisions, true novice, novice, and open. Let's say those are your divisions, right? You're going to come out for a true novice. You're going to do a routine once and you're not going to do it again. 
you're just coming right. out for comparisons for the other two the other two classes. That is across the board. So yep. be prepared for that. Like that's why that's why we talked about how you know it's it's important to know how you do your routine and all that. Don't get me wrong, but where you are really being judged is comparisons. Yeah, your routine is essentially, I want to say, really just for you and your yeah. family. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's the show. Um, but it is not what you're graded on. Really, the only time that they're looking at the individual routine is if you're splitting hairs between the uh -huh. first and the second girl, and they're just trying to figure out stage presence or something to knock you off on. Yep. Um, yeah, but that's why it's only once, because it, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. The individual yep. routine. Individual yep. routine at the segment of your comparison round and, you know, your front, back, front, back, front, back. So it's not, like you're saying, it's not something to overlook now because you know you only do it once. Uh -huh. um, you need to nail those comparison shots, and it's the same, same. Yep. That's right. You know, going back to, again, what we talked about in that last, that podcast, um, my client, Karen, when they did that pro show, they didn't do their routines during pre-judging. They came nope. out and did comparisons first, and then they did all the judging, and then at finals, they did their routines. They did their individual. Yep. Yeah, so, because it, it what and again, the decision is usually made in pre-judging. Mm -hmm. So then they're doing this at finals. That even shows you more that they're not using it as a way to grade you and to right. make your placing. That's right. Yep. The, and like you said, the individual is really there for you and your family, your friends, people to see all that, that kind of thing. And also, like you said, if it's a big show, you might stick out during your routine. Yep. You know, they may. Yep. And a regional show should be getting you ready for nationals. So right. if you have 40 plus girls in your class, I guarantee you that you don't want every girl doing her individual routine twice. Yep. You want to be there till one in the, in right. the, in the morning? <laughs> Right. right. So the, the expectation at the regionals is to set you up for nationals. So it's going to be the same, definitely, at nationals when you have 40-plus girls in your class. Yeah. We were talking about this weekend, we were talking about uh, Brandy, Brandy Lewis, that uh, one of my sponsored girls there. We talked about how when she went on stage for nationals, she won the overall at nationals, um, not this past year, but the year before. And everybody everybody was there said that as soon as she walked on that stage, everybody knew the whole show was hers. Me. Yeah. I said that, too. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> said that. And that's, that's the power of the individual right there. Yep. That's the power mm -hmm. of the individual routine. She literally just stepped on stage and won the show. Yep. So, yep. yeah, that's all you need. If you're that good, you're that good. Bottom line. If it's your you day, know. it's your day. That's yep. right. That's right. So just keep that in mind. It will only be once, but it's absolutely necessary. But so are the comparisons. Comparisons yep. are king. Comparisons are king. Um, let's do one more question. Let's go ahead and do, we kind of talked about this a little bit. So let's, let's, um, let's kind of recap on it. I said how to work on overdeveloped muscles. So we kind of talked about this a little bit when we were going to the training aspect earlier. So what would you do if you've got, you know, a muscle group, say, say, say your quads, since we're bikini, we're talking about staying in bikini, right? So if you're, um, if you've got overdeveloped quads, what would you do? Grow everything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and then it depends, you know, let's say the quads are overdeveloped. How much are they overdeveloped? Is are they just dis disproportionate or are they overdeveloped? To me, that's yep. two different things. Right. Do you have more quad than more glute, but you still don't really have enough quad? Well, then you've really got to bring up the glutes, but you can still put volume on the quads. Yeah. Um, if the quads are just way overdeveloped and you have no glutes, well, then you got to shut down knee flexion extension exercises. Uh -huh. That's me. I've been training uh -huh. knee flexion extension in three years since I started this sport. There has been no lunging. There has been no knee extensions, none of that. Uh -huh. um, so that that's it. You either just have to proportions. So, yes. and, and then if, like I said, if the muscle is truly overdeveloped, don't train it. Right. Or keep it in like rotation atrophy. every 10 days or every two weeks or something like that, just so it's getting a little volume to stay that you're not atrophying, but yep. you're not loading and growing it. Yep. Because again, going back to using myself as an example with my training changing now, when you look at my frame, you would almost say that my upper body is overdeveloped in comparison to my lower. But in reality, my upper body is just where it needs to be. And I need to, de to develop my lower body. Yep. Right. Yep. So that's why when we're changing the training, we're going to continue to stimulate the upper body with the one day a week. We don't need to grow it anymore. It just needs to stay where it is. Correct. You know, uh, same thing. We've got a opposing. I've got opposing clients. She's actually one of Jamie's training clients. Um, that she's her quads are overdeveloped, but that's just because she's underdeveloped from the back. Right. Yep. So a lot of it is her mobility. We talked about this on her last posing session. I was like, you just really got to get in there so that you can, you can open up your hamstrings and your glutes and things. I was like, you've got more muscle back there than you can see because yep. you just can't move it. 
you know, yeah. it's not, it's not mobile. I said, but your quads really aren't that big. It's just that they're, they, they look like they are in comparison to your back half, you know? Yeah. So I, and I will say nine those. times out of 10, you're going to be quad dominant. Most, most women are quad dominant. Yeah. It's hard for us to touch her glutes. There's one athlete I know that is glute dominant and it's Amy Delgado. No matter yeah. what exercise she does, she fills her glutes. Good for her. Yeah. Like that, that's not the normal. That is not the normal. Yeah. But, most clients are feeling their quads more than they do their glutes. And I spend usually one to two weeks when I start bringing on a new onboard with just trying to figure out how to knock down the quads and how to get more activation in the glutes. It's just a, the hip hinging is not something that we do in everyday life. We do need flexion extension more in everyday life, literally mm -hmm. walking flexion extension, walking upstairs, things like that. So of course the quads are going to be activated the most because that's what we're stimulating the most during the day. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's just about getting a good coach that can kind of teach you all of those things. And a good coach should know an overdeveloped muscle, which is just one that needs to be more proportioned and helping you guide you in your training that way, which yeah. again, I'm getting so many athletes where the coaches do not look at training form. They sometimes aren't even giving training at all, or they're yeah. giving a training program and they're not asking for feedback. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, to me, that's just crazy. Like uh -huh. this is, this is the number one thing in our sport. Yeah. So that's why I spend so much time on it. And I think that's why my girls have so much success with the growth that they have, because I spend so much time looking at the training piece. Uh -huh. We can be doing the food and the supplements and the cardio and everything else, but what are we doing in the gym to actually grow and make sure that we're not overdeveloping something and that we're staying within our, the category? Yep. It's so important. That was one of the eureka moments that I had during uh, Saturday was when Luke was talking about his wellness client and how they wanted to bring her glutes up because you look at her just from her glute, her back shot and stuff like that. Glutes are great, you know, but when you turn her to the front in comparison to the quads, they weren't, they weren't dense enough. They weren't, they didn't have enough, enough projection. They didn't have enough size in the back in comparison to the front. So they changed her training so that she was no longer hitting her quads. She, they were hitting just her glutes so they could bring the glutes up to match the quads. They could bring her, they, the, the critique was she wasn't in shape because he couldn't pull her down anymore because that was, there was feathering in the quads and there wasn't enough density in the glutes. So they brought her down so they could, they, when they, when they trained her again, they got her to the point where she had enough density and fullness in the glutes. So they could pull those glutes to be in shape without feathering the quads. And you know, she didn't have so, to get as lean because yes. she had the lean tissue. So yes. it goes back to what we said earlier. If you have the tissue, you don't have to get as lean. You don't have to diet as hard. Right. Right. So that was, that was one thing that, that, that stuck out to me um, quite a bit because that happens a lot. Happens a lot. Yeah. Um, and also going back to, I think one of the reasons why, like all the things you said, but also the quads are the mirror muscles, meaning you can see the quads, you know, yes. Uh, going back to the, the example that you gave of your client who's doing her boyfriend's workouts, those are all the mirror muscles. Those are all the muscles the boys can look at in the, in the, in the mirror. Yes. When you don't see it every day, you tend to not be able to connect with it as well. You tend to not That's work a great as point. hard, you know, those kinds of things. So That's a great yeah, point. Back, That's why training footage is key. <laughs> You know, like even if I'm not taking it for Jamie or if I'm not taking it to send to Drew, like I still do training footage, especially if something doesn't feel right. You know, yeah. I could see so much from my own training footage of, you know, is it, is it working? Is it not? I knew I'm not. Oh, that's why. Uh -huh. You know, it, it, don't don't sleep on that. Don't sleep on looking at your own progress. Even if you've been doing the move, I do the same movements all the time. I yeah. still have days where I'm like, Ugh, this isn't right. Yep. No, same. And some, some days you're just not feeling it either. And sometimes some days you're not concentrating and connecting with it. And you're just like, yep. Mm -hmm. check yourself check yourself check it, like again going back to yeah like we were talking about the mini cuts it's like sometimes when you take pictures all of a sudden you're like oh it's not that bad well here's the same thing you're like if you're, if you're recording yourself doing your your um training and stuff like that you can figure out if you're doing it right or if you're doing it wrong exactly exactly yeah, so um anything else that you wanted to uh wrap this up with on any of these points that we missed no i think we got it all cool we got some we got, got some good one yeah. <laughs> um so this is going to come out in this Valentine's Day. It's going to come out today. So we have a flash sale going on, um, I hope, on our site. We had a lot of visitors this morning on our site, and the whole site, site crashed. So hopefully it's back up by the time I get off this podcast. So we have a Valentine's flash sale for you guys. Um, I'll put the link in the description box. It's, right. it's to our key boutique. Um, I'm trying to think if I forgot anything. I don't think so. We're going to start up. Uh, I'm starting up with lives again on Thursday. So we've got shows coming up. We just had the Japan show and everything like that. So tomorrow night, it's going to be our first live back. We're going to start talking about the Arnold and all of that. 17 days till the Arnold. Yeah. I know. It's coming up fast. So yeah. 
And then the, then the season just starts rolling from there. We start going real, real quick at that point. So um, we'll be back again. We didn't do we didn't do an in-person podcast this weekend because we were, as we said, exhausted. So <laughs> I was like, I didn't even try. I didn't even bring it up to you on Sunday because I was like, I, just, I can't put two words together anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, we were all a little tired. <laughs> you guys went to the shooting range. I was like, cool. Now I don't have to worry about <laughs> And then I still had check-ins to do. (laughs) Oh, God. I was sitting there. Well, because, you know, on Sunday, I trained with with Drew and then did the check-in with Drew and Jamie. And then I trained with Yvette. And I'm sitting there. And by that point, I'm like, okay, I'm done. (laughs) So it was a long day. Yeah. A A long day after a long day. day. You guys today instead. (laughs) Exactly. All right, guys. So with that, we'll let you go and have a fantastic rest of your Valentine's Day. We love you. And um, yeah, so we'll be back again with the kid behind the bikini next week, same time, same place. And um, send in your questions, your comments, all that, because obviously we bring them and, and bring them to you while we're here as well. So yeah, that that's episode twenty-five, and we're out. Bye.